Hello, welcome everybody back to the Equine Touch studio. We've got a lovely photograph here of Mila, who's Babette Littlemore's horse. She's uh, one of our Equine Touch instructors, and Babette's going to be telling us about how Mila got back on her feet and how Equine Touch helped her in that process. So we're just going to meet all of us here. So there's me, I'm one of the instructors, you'll know my face by now, Babette's an Equine Touch instructor, and Babette, if you'd like to take us from here and uh, introduce us to your other contributors. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, it's great to be able to chat uh, today about how equine touch can help horses um, deal with emotional trauma. And I'm delighted uh, to be joined by two of my students. Um, both are on the practitioner route, um, yeah. listening through their case studies and their theory work. And I can't wait until they're fully qualified and out there helping even more horses. Uh, so we have Liv, your little wave, Olivia. Um, and Nikki, um, and uh, they will each be talking about um, a case study that's really relevant to this topic um, and how they found Equine Touch uh, really being able to shift things uh, in the lives of a couple of horses um, where uh, both of them kind of have talked to me about being blown away by the results they've seen. Um, but before that, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background um, about myself and how I got into Equine Touch. Um, so I uh, discovered the modality um, when I was looking uh, to help my own horse, uh, Sunny, um, and he was suffering from a very bad sacroiliac uh, strain, um, becoming extremely nappy. Um, he was 15 at the time. Uh, I was looking to having to retire him. He had a lot of very invasive vet um, procedures, injection, shockwave therapy, um, and he was just getting more and more miserable. Um, I discovered Equine Touch, discovered how much he loved it, um, and uh, I learned that you could go and train and learn how to do it yourself, which I did. And at that point, that was my only intention, was to learn it to help him. Um, Equine Touch, you'll discover, if you haven't already, it's very addictive. Um, and uh, uh, after doing the courses, I realised that actually what I needed to do was to do all the courses again um, and do the practitioner route. Um, so I qualified uh, well over a decade ago and um, have loved helping horses of all sizes and shapes and issues. Um, and then I became an instructor um, and I've had such a blast kind of teaching um, horse owners, horse lovers, uh, horse professionals, um, both who just want to learn the technique and, and do it on their own horse, and, but also the ones who want to take it the full way and become practitioners themselves. Um, Sunny is right outside the window. He's now 32. Uh, so Equine Touch gave me kind of an additional 17 years of, of happy ridden life with him. Um, he is more supple now than he was at 15. Um, and he is still very much the herd leader. Um, so he's kind of confident and happy and um, having a great, great kind of senior year. Um, That's a great story there, Babette. That's yeah. lovely to hear. And, and, and obviously you can see the joy in your face that you've managed to keep with him for so long. Yeah, no, he's a fabulous equine touch teacher as well. So he, I, I kind of say all the words, but he's the one who really helps his students uh -huh. figure out what equine touch is all about. Because when they do a good move, he does a huge exaggerated process to say, yes, that was it. <laughs> you know, he's a great teacher. Um, and I was going to talk a bit about how equine touch, whilst it's obviously an excellent form of body work to work on the physical body of the horse. Um, one of the things that I didn't realize when I started was just how powerful it can be in terms of really addressing the emotional aspect of a horse. Um, and one of the philosophies of equine touch is we call it AII, but it stands for accuracy, integrity, and intent. Um, and particularly the latter kind of two um, is really about kind of our own reason for doing equine touch and the fact that we're doing it kind of as a gift to the horse. So we're never forcing body work onto a horse that doesn't want it. Um, if we kind of think, ah, oh, if this horse might benefit from some moves on its hindquarters and the horse says, nope, that's not somewhere I'm happy having you then rather than kind of push through and try and force that horse to accept it, we completely back off and we go and find an area where the horse will accept us, will accept the move, 
Um, often we really have to change the level of pressure we're working with. Um, so we can go super light, we can go kind of moving, I do moves in the air. Um, so finding where the horse is happy uh, to have equine touch done. Um, and it means that kind of for some horses who are very used to invasive things and being treated in a certain way, they can just find kind of some wonderful relaxation, knowing that we're very much on their side. Um, and kind of that bond between horse and um, equine touch practitioner or their owner, if they've learned equine touch, um, can just really, really um, increase because of that. Um, and I wanted to talk about how horses are prey animals. Um, and that kind of, we all know that, we know that kind of they get spooky because they think they might see um, kind of predators where there are none. Um, I tell my herd that there are no tigers in the Cotswolds, but they point blank refuse to believe me. Um, but why it's so significant is that a horse that has pain, that has an injury, that has weakness in its body, um, they feel very emotionally vulnerable because they kind of think, oh, I'm going to be the one that gets eaten first. So in the herd, kind of the really strong, kind of pain-free uh, horses that have a fluid movement, that are happy and healthy, kind of they're able to, they, they realize they're still a prey animal, they're still kind of just spook occasionally, but their whole kind of emotional outlook is just really different um, to a horse that has, kind of pain that it's also why horses try really really hard not to show pain so it's something kind of been building up for weeks months before we as the human owner can spot it um, and by that point there can be a whole heap of compensatory issues going on as well um, so there's kind of this double whammy of it affects the emotion but also Kind of there can be a lot more going on in the body um, than at first glance. Yeah, and I think when they're prey animals, they have, you know, if they're in the wild, they would be able to leave a negative stimulus. You know, they'd be able to, to, yeah. to disappear or go away, whereas yeah. actually we confine them, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's with a horse that's bullying next door, whether it's in a, in a bad environment that they're not enjoying. And so they can then just internalise that and then shut down because they don't want to have to deal with it. I mean, if you think about us as humans... You know, if we end up being somewhere where we're not very happy or we feel the pressure of whatever, we can just then take ourselves out of out of the environment, go and hide in the corner, all that sort of thing. And you'll find the horses will be doing that, too. So, yep. it could be, you know, not and not being part of the herd and the herd is the security for a horse. So if you've got a horse that doesn't want to be part of the herd because he doesn't feel safe um, or he doesn't want to integrate, then that makes it even more tricky for them and how they internalize that sort of emotions and things. No, absolutely. Um, yeah. In terms of kind of how equine touch can help, obviously it can help in, terms of in reducing the pain cycle. So by addressing whatever physical issue is going on, they can kind of be healthy, pain free. Um, but also I found that it can really help with uh, kind of releasing historical trauma. Um, and I've been surprised how much that really can sit in the body. Um, so set and touch, we do a set sequence of moves and we lead up to what we call processing breaks. Um, so allowing the horse to really uh, absorb the move and kind of realise that vibrational effect it has on the body. Um, the horse will often yawn, will look really relaxed, will look in chi. Um, and whilst that shows it's releasing things physically in its body, often I also find that it actually releases things emotionally um, and that can be hugely powerful um, so that the horse can learn to trust humans to realize that actually we are not just something the kind of being that causes pain or discomfort but actually we can help um, and it can open up that two-way conversation rather than as you were saying Chris with a horse that's very locked down and kind of shut down um, Suddenly you can kind of think, ah, yes, this horse does realise um, that actually you know, humans humans aren't just there kind of to be a nuisance, we can actually be a friend. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to talk about um, the first case study, which you mentioned right at the start, which is Mule. Um, and she um, is my sister's horse. 
um, but she lives with me here. Um, and she was a rescue when she was six months old. Um, you can see in that top left photo, um, she had been horribly mishandled as a foal, um, had a very traumatic weaning, and she was skin and bone, kind of lice, worms, completely untouchable. Um, and because at that point I was already doing X Ray Touch, um, kind of she really came to trust humans purely through that power of equine touch. Um, and because she had so many physical things wrong with her, um, I remember writing to the equine touch magazine about her really being a typical example of being an onion horse. And by that, I mean having so many different layers that as the practitioner, you have to go in and gradually sort of feel you fix one thing, something else appears, you deal with that, you kind of, it's all these different um, kind of things that kept coming up. Um, and even today, she's still a horse where if she feels something in her environment isn't right, that immediately expresses itself in the level of tension she has in the musculature. Um, so you can kind of almost assess her through feeling her muscles. Um, and she um, is extremely um, uh, kind of receptive when it comes to the energy that you bring to a session. Um, really kind of likes the sort of feeling intent and the gentle nature of equine touch. She's the type of horse that if you came in and wanted to do something um, kind of that was higher pressure or more invasive, that would just be an instant no. Mm -hmm. so there's there's um, just a very good example of the horse that in other hands, I think would have ended up dangerous, would have ended up um, being passed to this post. Um, whereas for that kind of touch and having regular that kind of touch, and she found a really harmonious state um, within her body and within her mind. Um, so I think that would be uh, kind of good, good summary for her. And um, know that Nikki also has uh, in her yard an onion pony. Um, so Nikki, do you want to talk a bit about Casper and how Equine Touch has helped him? Okay, so um, when I first um, got Castor, it's supposed to have been a riding horse for my son. Um, we were hugely missold him. Um, you know, apart from the fact she said you can't catch him in the field, but by she went off to go and get a bucket of feed to get him in, he just put himself in my trailer. Um, and um, we sort of got him home, but realised, you know, obviously as the days went on that he was like, actually no humans are coming anywhere near me forget that um, I'm not having anything um, we sort of gradually realized that actually there were a lot of things going on with him um, had quite a few rescue horses by then so I was like I hadn't planned on rescuing this horse but um, yeah realized there were lots of things going on um, but it was really hard because I couldn't actually get anyone to go in and help him so again that sort of like thing about you know vets and I know like chiropractors things like that they all come in with a bit of a purpose and as soon as that was the case there was no way anyone was going to get him out of the field um but for some reason he just seemed to sort of like i don't know, hide behind me um and in the herd he would hide himself behind the herd leader but was actually evil to everybody else in the field so he was you know again I, he's another one i think uh, equine touch sort of saved um because it was it was the right way in it was that gift and that like integrity and intent really where I was like asking him if that was okay that really um I'd say so there was points when we had conversations with the vet about putting him to sleep whether it was kinder um just because you know you just if you if you can't help them then actually you know where do we go I mean if anyone else had him again I think he would have probably ended up being put to sleep but for some reason i just thought if he's put his trust in me then it's up to me to see if i can find some way um and i saw babette's um horse owners workshop i think it was and i thought right i'm gonna go and see what this is i didn't think i could do massage and things i was doing reiki at the time um and i just thought you know i'll just see if there's any way i can try and get you know my hands on him to help him um yeah and it was you know to start with he wouldn't have anything so i did all it was all air moves it was like just standing with him getting him to relax and then just and gradually just came a bit closer and you know it started off with a couple of moves on his pole and on his face and slowly and slowly he just kept coming for a bit more and a bit more um 
and again he was yeah, he's definitely an onion pony <laughs> because every time we got through somewhere and we thought we'd sorted something something else appeared um mm. but actually you know he's you know now i can walk into the field and i can tell if he needs it because he's just at the gate like this he's just yawning and he's just ready and he's like right i'm i'm here i'm ready you know get on with it type thing whereas before he wouldn't um now you know we did get him to the point where he could be ridden he was at lives for a while actually wasn't yeah, he lives. was yeah um but there was just something just a little yeah. bit uncomfortable about him um yeah. And again, this was another thing where we were like, right, we still obviously haven't uncovered everything. Um, mm. We actually had hit, had some scans done with the vet um, and he actually has really bad um, testicular scarring. So whoever gelded him did a really bad job, which will sort of goes with the fact that he had a shoulder injury when we had bought him that hadn't been disclosed. Um, and obviously that crosses his diagonal and then there's, um, he has a um, impinged nerve in his spine, so that's mm -hmm. where the unpredictability of riding. It's just that slight mm -hmm. jarring, slight misfooting, anything like that would just send him. Um, just it was just wasn't him. He just wasn't himself. Mm -hmm. um, so we've chosen then not to ride him anymore. But um, but he's happy. He's in the field. He's a really good. Um, He's got his good place in the field. Um, he gets on with everybody. You know, anyone can catch him. Anyone can do anything with him. Um, and, you know, I'm hoping to do um, therapy for, like, as in, like, humans for anxiety, um, all that sort of stuff, um, um, equine facilitated learning, basically. Um, but also just the therapy side. And I think he's actually going to be really, really good for that because I think he will choose the people that, he needs to help if you see what I mean um so yeah that, so that's that's my introduction to ET obviously started with that just being able to do something with him and thinking oh my god this is amazing um doing it on different horses going out and practicing and just seeing you know when people so many people have said to me oh you know well so and so he's had this they've had that we're still not getting anywhere you know just see what you can do and actually they're like yeah actually I quite like this because we're asking permission first, I think. Yeah. Um, it's almost like you're going in asking to see them and to hear them. And I think that's what probably everything else is missing, really. I think mm. my my understanding, really. So, mm. so yeah, so Casper's the, the one that made me go on and do the practitioners. Because once I started learning, I was like, oh, my God, this is a whole new, this is a whole new world out here that I just need to find out more from. Um, and, and yeah. that wonderful Nikki that kind of helped him and now he can go on to help humans. Like there's that lovely yeah, yeah, yeah. mirror mirror so in he, So yeah, so he's gone from the fact that, you know, like literally nobody he was always like, Oh, he's your horse. No nobody could go near him, you know. He was just so ears back and you know, I'm just gonna bite you, I'm gonna kick you. You know, you're lucky if you only got a tail swish. To now he's like, well, actually, why aren't I coming in? Why, why, you know, when can I come out and do something? So that's just, you know, he could have been put to sleep because that was an option I explored. So, you know, there's just always, there's always something, isn't there? There's always that chance if you can just listen to them and and ask, really, isn't it? Rather yeah. than just going and doing. Yeah. Fantastic, Nikki. Well done. He's very chilled out now, bless him. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that's what he spends most of his day doing. I'm sure for years he never yawned, you know, because there's just like so much yawning going on. <laughs> oh, I'm really glad. It's lovely to hear that. Cause, yeah, because I think he was very much a sort of like, I don't want anyone near me, but I'm just going to stand here and grip my teeth and just tell the world I'm really angry, you know, and as opposed to having any way of releasing any of that. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah, equine touch is definitely saved him i think lovely and i was going to go and talk about um one of my clients horses a beautiful black creation mare called nelly um, and she uh, rather than becoming angry she had become completely shut down so she had been overused in the riding school um, and had essentially learned that there was no point trying to communicate anything to humans because nobody listened so what's the point and the first time I saw her, just when um, I can't, Wendy had taken her on, um, it was like working on a rocking horse. So her whole body felt completely solid. 
there was no kind of visibility in the skin, um, but also there was no interest from her. So completely kind of blank behind the eyes, um, no interaction, no kind of, it was just like, well, there's another human, I'm just going to ignore them. Um, and she didn't really show any signs of processing the exine touch I was doing. Um, and I kind of left thinking, oh, it would be interesting um, to see if I get invited back because there just wasn't really much um, uh, kind of feedback that I could be the owner because the horse wasn't really showing very much. Um, but Wendy's a really lovely, uh, very lovely individual and has the Horses Welfare Wife uh, Centre. Um, and she said, oh, no, of course, come back. Let's see what a second session can do. And uh, I turned up and found an area kind of just behind the lumber um, where an awful lot of heat um, kind of radiated from her uh, as I was working over it. Um, and kind of, I really felt that there was much more movement through her spine, um, that kind of as I was progressing various muscles, um, she was turning around to look at me and she allowed me to go off and work more on her face than she had the first time. Um, she started showing some licking and chewing. Um, and as I started to work on the kind of hindquarters again, we were getting a nice kind of flow through the body. Um, and suddenly she felt like a real horse rather than a rocking horse. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of wooden you know, tendency had gone. Mm -hmm. um, and I got lovely feedback from Wendy um, that it was the first time that she'd ever seen in her role when she was turned out in the field. The next day was the first time she'd ever come up to the person catching her, um, rather than um, just walking away. Um, and I saw nearly many more times uh, Wendy and her daughter Pippa when actually went and learnt at Crown Touch, so they had continued helping Nelly um, and they've come back to the regular courses here. Um, and she's just become this powerful, characterful, um, Horse that just has so much to give, uh, cheeky, um, and it's just such uh, a kind of indication that when they feel they're listening to as Mickey was saying, that you can have a conversation with a human, that you can have a life without pain, um, that actually it's which is just gonna, oh, oh, this is actually pretty good. And kind of gone off kind of on her merry way. Um, and I think there are so many horses that kind of react in that kind of binary thing of either becoming angry, dangerous, the difficult horse um, is a pain, or they give up and become shut down. Um, and I think it's kind of a great uh, credit that can touch, that even though the approach is sometimes a little bit different, you can really help both those kind of types of horses. Um, mm -hmm with the emotional um, kind of releasing that they can learn to trust humans, that they can find this really deep relaxation. One of the things I love um, is after a course here, when the students have gone home and I'm just kind of turning up, just seeing how totally relaxed my herd is. Like, some, like I sometimes have to literally like pick up their, their heads because they're just on the ground, like some, just having <laughs> such a kind of good sleep um, and kind of in a life that can be filled with so many demands, go to competitions, go in a horse box, go and do this, go and do that, have a saddle on, have a rider, um, but actually they can just have these moments of mm -hmm. nothing being asked of them, but us giving them a gift. Mm -hmm. And that's really think, Yeah, I think that, and I think, that's really interesting because right at the beginning when Jock was asked to work on a horse, he had no experience of horses. So he didn't know all he, so he had to go in with that, with his intent was just, I'm here to help the horse. And he went into a number of stables, particularly when we talk about his first experience with horses in Aberdeen, where afterwards they said, Oh, don't go in with that horse because that, that horse will, you know, will is vicious. But he'd gone in with a totally different mindset and the horse had, had, had obviously sensed that in him. And 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 so and so he never went in with that. I'm going to fix you because as soon as you do that, you have you change your energy, you change your whole intention, mm -hmm. um, and it has to be a, a different. It's the doing. That's a doing thing where we're trying to just be with the horse, meet it mm -hmm. in its own, meet it at the same space, 
you know, when we're using our Tai Chi move, we're using Aikido, we're using no breath, we're not holding on to the breath, which makes them fear what's going on, you know. So I just think it's really interesting how that sort of it, it did evolve. You know, we talked about evolving before and definitely it's just evolved out of that. His innate, Jock's innate ability to connect, connect. And, and you'll see that we'll see that in a number of different ways. So, yeah, lovely. But that's a great story for that. She's just so beautiful, isn't she? Oh, she is. And it's lovely how the character comes out that you then mm. have the personality. They're prepared to show their personality. Yeah. You know? And she, I mean, she seems like a completely different horse to the one I first. I mean, you could put them side to side and you wouldn't think it was the same horse. Yeah. But, you know, that's also true for Liv's uh, horse, Teddy. Um, she's seen some she's really profound changes. Um, so, Liv, do you want to, to talk us through kind of the history of Teddy and how equine touch has helped him? Yes. So, um, Teddy, as you can see in this picture, so this is the first two minute ride that we did when we had him back to our place where we're currently based um, just to see how he was. So we knew when we bought him that his saddle didn't fit and his feet were rubbish and they'd used a big bit in his mouth because he was speedy. Um, and basically they'd sold him because they couldn't get anything more out of him. They couldn't even catch him. Um, so we had him and this is him being ridden by uh, one of my girls who's pretty experienced at this point, and he doesn't actually have a saddle on. He has a sheepskin numner, and he was still just so hollow and miserable um, that we literally did two minutes, took a couple of photos, and was like, right, that's enough. We'll get off him. So this is a long time ago now. This is eight years ago. Um, and I just was very lucky that the first time I tried him out before we, before we bought him, I just thought I can feel like there's still... A really amazing animal in here and I feel like he wants to change um, I don't think I realized it was going to take me quite so long <laughs> when I bought him um, but he was he was a real exactly like the, the girls were saying very shut down when we first had him he literally hid in his stable for the first three months and he was just like if I just pretend I'm not here everybody will leave me alone um, well because it's my job I can't do that so what is your um, job you, you what is it so i run a biomechanics riding school oh. um, i'm a ride with your mind coach i have been for nearly 17 years um, and used it for a bit longer than that um and i'm quite used to rescuing horses um and have i hope a fairly well an ever increasing skill set for helping them and ride with your mind has really helped a lot of horses in my experience because of trying to ride them correctly and sort your own biomechanics out and all the rest of it so that already made a big difference but as as nikki knows there are the odd ones that you can't get into when you can't you know you just you just feel there's something there but you just don't know how to sort it so he was a long 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 process of bowing and uh working in hand and all sorts of things and very gentle rides and for a long time we just just treated him very very carefully he didn't canter him for the first five years until he offered it um, and you can see from the picture here on the left, this is probably, I don't know, maybe three years in, um, maybe even four. You can still see in the shade, in the light there that he's got a dippy back. There's still muscle missing underneath the saddle. And he's just looks a bit Eeyore. I do call him my Eeyore. I might have to change that now, though, thanks to Equine Touch. Um, and he's always been, you know, he doesn't, he, he seems to quite enjoy working and always has done, as far as I can tell. Um, he's always, only ever been in a snaffle. His bit got bigger and bigger as he released tension from his mouth. Um, he was going around like Princess and the Pea, so he used to have like three layers under his saddle to make him comfortable. That's amazing, Olivia. So you're saying that his that he's he had to have a narrow bit because his teeth he was so clamped in his jaw and everything. Yes, and actually, wow. uh, I found that with most horses that come in, um, I usually change about an inch and yeah. sometimes more um, from that. And I, I kind of, you, you know, we were we were sort of discussing before we started about, you know, what's it opened your mind to? And I'm like, I kind of think there's so many things that are so weird when I tell people that these things are going to change. They're like, yeah, yeah, right, Liv. Yeah, yeah, right, Liv. But they do, you know, their feet change and their mouth change and their bridle fit changes. So some of them need bigger brow bands because they, they lose tension. Um, and I think what Nikki was saying about how you hit up against, I know there's something wrong, but I don't quite have the skills to hit it. Um, I think what was surprising with Teddy was that I, I maybe thought in the back of my head, maybe this is as good as it gets. You know, he's not under any any pressure. I, I don't have a time scale for him. Um, 
but he just kind of kept getting better. He met Amelia's hands, and Amelia was Amelia Widows was was uh, sorry, Perdue, yes, Widows now she is um, was practicing her ET. Um, and Kat, who Nikki knows, was doing some of the straightness training with him, and it was all making a difference. But we you know it was kind of slowly, slowly, slowly. Um, and then after we, Amelia had been practicing the ET on him before lockdown he just started playing a lot more and he plays. So this is what the right hand picture is here. This is him and Patchy, um, who's an absolute loon sometimes, bless him, pretends he doesn't know me some days and other days I'm the best thing since sliced bread. But him and him and Teddy would play a lot. Um, and I thought, right, well, if he can play, then things must be getting better. Um, and then we had lockdown. So um, obviously not having people visiting the yard, so really couldn't come with their case study. So that's what made me start. I thought they're queuing in the field to talk to her, to have equine touch. And one of the things I don't like about my job is the fact that I have a job with them. So I can't just sort of float around. I have to actually get some money in. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, well, I'd really like to spend some time with them that's just about them and not about getting this done or getting that done or keeping this client happy. Even though I love teaching, I really felt like I'd lost that part of my life um, mm -hmm. doing it as a business where I just sit with them and they talk to me. And I and I kind of, I was a bit resentful about that, actually. I was a bit like, oh, you know, there's always another bill to pay and it's all on my head because I have 10 most of the time and I don't employ anyone. So I do most, but not all of the coaching. Uh, well, all of the coaching, most, not all of the, the chores. And various people have helped over the years, certainly in the beginning. Um, but I just kind of felt a bit resentful. I was never doing with them what I really felt they wanted to do. Um, I'm not saying that every lesson was that they didn't want to do, but it was just like I felt like I wanted to give something back. Yeah. Um, and so I started, went to the, to the Equine Touch Day and went back to the yard thinking, oh, gosh, I don't know what I'm doing, but here goes. And was just totally blown away. Ten different horses, ten very different responses. Um, but the one that really struck me, that had changed it, what we're talking about here emotionally as well as physically is Teddy. So he's gone from tolerating humans being around and not very many of us, only sort of me and one or two other people have anything to do with him to kind of being much more curious, which I always think is a good sign. Um, so this is my son riding him. Um, and Teddy doesn't generally like men, but he loves Geth. Um, and so I thought I'd put them bitless and send him off on a fun ride. So they went off. <laughs> Afterwards, he was like, "Mom, you do realize I didn't have any breaks?" I said, "Yeah, but you look like you were fine." So this is, the, I, I hope I'm not imagining it, the complete opposite of the other picture where he's been ridden, where he's just having a riot, having an absolute riot. So yeah, yeah that's, that's an extraordinary kind of difference. Yeah, I mean, just just so so different. And I do all the time think, oh my god, am I doing the right thing? You know, have I done enough? Have I, you know, it's hard. It's really hard. I don't get everything right, and I'm still learning. Um, but That's I thought good. in that picture, I thought, yeah, I think I think we've done right by this one. Um, and then the last set of pictures are some of the things that we've been doing. So this is the picture on the bottom left. Sorry, it's not very big, guys, but. Um, is my favourite picture of him and his back, which is now not looking like some gappy, holy, um, I don't know, like sort of doormat thing that's been ruined by the humans. That's not to say that he's perfect and it's ever going to be completely perfect. It's not. But I love that picture. He's 24 in that picture. Wow. Um, after a really hard life. And I don't think he looks it. And he, he the top right-hand one is we took him to the beach and he is a little bit like, oh, God, what does she want now? You know, what are we doing now? Oh, taking the youngster to the beach. But actually, when he was there, he seemed to really enjoy himself. And this bottom right picture is two days ago with me, hopefully trying to get a picture for this, to show him going, it was actually what you couldn't see is he's rocking backwards and forwards. So one thing he doesn't like about E.T. is he doesn't like it if I rock, but he moves and maybe that will change. Maybe that will change later on. He doesn't like it if I take my hand off between moves, but maybe that will change. But he's now, every time he sees me now, he almost pulls me into the stable to go, come on, come in here and do this. And it's just totally changed his mindset about humans being part of the solution and not part of the problem. That's fantastic, Lou. Beautiful. And he's my favourite, but don't tell the others. <laughs> <laughs> An official favourite. Yeah, unofficial favorite, but he is. He may, he just, you know. But it's very interesting. You were saying about the Frisian that that shut down. Um, I've got a mini one of those 
that I think I made me think, oh, okay, maybe I need to persevere and do more. So with him, I did five days back to back, which made a big difference after he tweaked himself in the field. And I suspect that with little Billy, who's very shut down, I thought, oh, okay, that's, that's, that's one of those things. Cat and I always say there's, there's two things, the way, that's the way things are, ding, 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 ding. And oh, they've always been like that. So whenever I hear anybody say that, or I feel myself think that, I think, okay, so what are we missing? And I will go back and do some more with her too, basic on, on maybe Frisians do shut down when they're in trouble. And maybe she, we don't know really, but maybe she is part Frisian. She looks like that. Mm-hmm. So that would be really interesting to see. I'm going to spend the rest of my life being nosy about <laughs> what other things that quite touch can change. <laughs> well, and there's so many instances of people who say, oh, well, my horse always yes. the cancer or moves away from the mountain yeah. brook or tries to bite me when I do up the death. And I completely agree with you, Liv, that kind of you think, well, it doesn't have to be that way. Like, no. what is the reason behind that? And how we have to kind of almost be detectives and kind of think, well, what is it that's going on? Yes. What is the horse telling me, isn't yeah. it? As opposed yeah. to this behaviour or it's yeah. naughty or it does this. It's actually, no, it's telling you the only way it can. And I just think yeah. we seem to have lost that as humans, don't we? I think they give us... They're just amazing creatures that can give us so much, but in our busyness to do things and fix things. And, you know, I don't know whether social media is it that's made, you know, all these people look like they're going out being successful. So there's that whole push for that. But we seem to have lost that, you know, just being with them and, you know, listening to them, isn't it? I think that's what I found probably with more of my case studies is, you know, I've got, I've had, well, I have had some owners where they were like, I haven't fixed them in one session. So they've just gone. And I'm like, that's such a shame because I could do so much for that horse. But that's something I'm going to have to learn to live with. Um, but we don't uh, use the word fix, Nikki. Pardon? We don't use the word fix. Oh, yeah, sorry. No. But, you know, but but thing actually, is, I, I could that's help. That's a very you know. important thing, though, Nikki, to, to, not, to not hold on to the outcome. Because yeah, yeah. ultimately, you all you can do is you can offer what you can do, and you've if even if you've you've helped the horse, whether or not the person is going to carry on or believe in what you've done, that's up to them. But you've you've helped that horse in that instant, so yeah, you've just got to let people come to it in their own way. It is very hard. I think one of the things looking back with all the horses that I've helped or tried to help is I kick myself that like. Thinking about if I'd started Equi Touch eight years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you think of the horses that you didn't manage to help or you, you didn't make a big enough difference or you ran out of time or money, yeah. um, either yours or the owners. And it's just like, oh, God, if only I'd. And it's it's I can see why you might get drawn into that if you're not really careful. Yeah. And it's like when, when people say because there are things that I've seen quite close to home that I really don't agree with. Um and people said, oh, why don't you do something about it? And it's just like, I'm just concentrating on my 10 because that's yeah. all I can realistically do. Yeah. And all the ones that are in front of me right now. And I'm just not going to drive myself mad about the others because you can't help all of them. You can't. You can't. And if you go bonkers and give up, you can't do anything, can no. you? And the thing is, Liv, also, that when you're doing, when you're working uh, and you're noticing all that stuff and, and you feel frustrated that you could have done that in the past, I think you've just got to think, but all those frustrations brought you, yes. when you saw what Equine Touch could do, you grabbed it with both hands. Yes. And yes. You, because it gave you back that connection with the horses that yes. you sort of lost because you were, as you say, you were doing all the teaching and the running the yard and everything. And that's what you were missing. Yeah, you know, you're missing really, that real connection with them again. Yeah, it's really been a beautiful right. thing to have that back because I, I, it's always been. It means one of the things people say to me, "Oh, what's it like having 10? And I'm like, "It's not ten times the fun of having one." As soon as I owned my own horse, I stopped dreaming about them because of the stress of trying to keep everything going and have you made the right decision and have you done the right thing and and I've, I've had to homeschooling my children as well and I've had you know, quite serious health issues in the last five years which I didn't really know what was going on at the time and things like I just think oh my god am I doing the best it's just like yes 
you just try and do the best every day and that's all you can do and I think also what you were saying about energy if you take that kind of oh god energy into the horses <laughs> I mean that's probably one way where I am vaguely saying is I can't yeah. do that around mine because of the collection and the histories that they come from if you take all that baggage in with you into the stables you would never get anything done because they'd be no. like whoa she's crazy she's stressed she's angry she's frustrated not no thanks and yeah I and I think and I think that's really interesting because you guys have obviously got more than one horse. And it's those of us who have one horse where we can get obsessed about the one horse and take <laughs> things personally and all that sort of stuff. Whereas it sort of gets a bit diluted. You know, I think the horses have yeah, to put up with so yeah. much rubbish from their owners. And I know, if I, um, Babette, you've got another talk in mind about trying to be positive and leaving all your angst at the, the gate as you come in rather than bringing it to the stable with the, with the poor horses, because sometimes, it, you know, for those of us who live in yards, sometimes it can be really tricky to see how the other horses are, you know, sometimes ignored, you know, and, and you do. I see the ones that that sense that they're not getting what some of the others are getting because they haven't got that nice owner or someone who yeah. seems to really want to spend time with them. That must be hard. Very tricky. Very tricky. That must be hard. At least I don't have that. So all the little faces look at me and go, Liv, you sort it. It's, so at least I don't have to. And actually, it's one of the reasons why I haven't got involved in what's out there is because you can't help all of them. And sometimes you can't help the ones you're trying to help. And mm. you would just go bonkers if you kept looking. You just go bonkers because there's so many. I mean, I don't go. I had two of my girls that I helped look after used to work at a very well-known event center, not up here in Cotswold, somewhere else. And I just thought I could got to the point where I could drop them off for work and pick them up again and not see a single horse because I just couldn't look. Mm. Just couldn't look at what's going on and what passes for. But you know, when you help one horse, it helps all horses because of the consciousness, it helps all horses and you're changing, you're changing the dynamic for everybody. Well, so, and I hope, you know, you can only do what you can do, can't you? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, but earlier, Chris, about kind of being with the horse. I think that energy is just very different. So we're called human beings, but actually, most of the time, we are end up being human doings. Mm -hmm. We have our to do list, and we have all these goals, and we have all these things we want to do. Um, and the horses that are so good at being and yes. being rooted and being connected to the herd, when we are willing also be in that being state mm. they are finally like this is somebody that we can we can get on with because they can mm. guess where we're at mm. i remember one of the things i did i did with my horses you know because you you know when you um you're learning to you think i can i can keep i'm going to keep making you better I'm going to keep making you better and he was getting oh I'm sick of you trying to make me better you know can you not just chill out and uh, I won't tell you how I heard about that. But anyway, because that's a whole another sort of ethereal thing. But ultimately, there was one day I went in the stable and I just stood there. I didn't do anything. I just stood there. And he stood on the other side of the stable and he sort of looked at me. And then he looked at me again. And I thought, and, and then he just looked at me again. And then he started. I and mean, he wasn't just yawning. He was snaking his neck like they do when they're angry on the lunge or something like that. He started snaking his neck. He started releasing things. And he gradually moved towards me. And then I stay standing there doing nothing. And then he came a little bit closer. And then I ended up crying. And then he came a little bit closer. And he ended up with his head on my forehead. Oh. And I thought, we've, we've gone to a different place. That was a big, big thing for me that I went to a different place. Because I wasn't, even when I was trying to use my ET intent, I, I wasn't trying to sort him out all the time. I realized that actually there was a two-way street going there. And he was doing as much for me. I think that's the that's yeah. the thing we have. They are doing a lot for us. I do think it's it's interesting. Oh gosh, because I've been doing in, things with with troubled horses for you know probably long, like you guys have been as well, and you know not turning things away if you can possibly help it. But it's been a long, long time. And one of the things I love about being part of this community now is that not feeling like you're in on your own. It's so exhausting feeling like you're one of one or two people that are trying to make a difference, especially when quite close to home, there's some really, really unpleasant things going on. You know, horses being schooled till their mouths are bleeding and things like that. And it's it's just like, you just think, oh God, am I the only person out here who's trying to do something? And to be part of a bigger community, you know, people who'll tell you that you've got something wrong or people who say, well, try this skill or do that in a nice way. 
as opposed to being surrounded by, which is what most of the time is at the moment, people who think you're nuts or that you're incompetent or that you're, you know, making it up or away with the fairies or, and and it's just kind of like, I, I watched a demonstration with um, Linda Tellington Jones a couple of months ago and she works with them on such a beautiful, quiet level. But the people who were there who didn't already get it, didn't get it. You know, they kind of went out going, what was she doing? And it's just like, you know, you have to, we have to keep bridging that gap, don't we? Between, you know, I suppose I always think about it as the science of it and the fluffiness of it and the the look at what the horse is telling you. But to be part of a community where you can bandy ideas around and admit that your horse made you cry in it by looking at you from a other stable or, or yeah. admit that, you know, I, you know, I got stuck on this one and I just ran out of ideas or, or, or whatever without feeling like you're this high, which yeah. is how the rest of the community makes you feel all the time. <laughs> um, that's a beautiful segue to uh, the fact we actually have a promotion in this silver jubilee year uh, for people who want to join uh, AITEC. International Equine Trucks Association. Um, so to join this lovely community of like-minded uh, horse lovers, um, there's a fabulous online conference coming up uh, towards the end of the year, um, and there's just so much you can access. Um, and we're offering a special rate of £10 just to make sure that everybody feels they can afford it. Um, nobody uh, feels kind of excluded from that community. And um, there's the email address here. Um, and if you would like to join Asia, it would be wonderful um, to have you as part of our community. Um, you're also very welcome, everybody, to join uh, Equine Touch Addicts, which is our open Facebook group. Um, and thank you very much uh, for listening to, to kind of the four of us talk about Equine Touch and helping horses heal emotional trauma. Yeah. And how and how inspiring it's been for all of us. I think it's been lovely. And I, and, and you know the work you're doing, Liv and Nikki and Babat. I mean, it's all it's all just brilliant. And we've just got to keep going. We've just got to keep going because it, because it is that helping horses by educating people. And even if they see something when they don't understand and they go, "That's not for me," that's fine. They've seen it. You know, on some level, they've yeah. seen it. Yeah. Keep translating. Keep yeah. translating. Keep going. Yeah. Well done, everybody. Thank you very much. That's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much, guys. Take care then. Bye. Bye.